I'm Kelly Rogers, Associate Editor, Editor for DevX, and we're joining you here for the last day of Women Deliver. I'm joined today by Mina Mojdahedi, who is the Inclusion Advisor for Disability Inclusion Advisor for ICRC, and also by Rose Achayo, who is a chairperson of Uganda's National Union of Women with Disabilities. So thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank and you for having us. And so when we're talking about vulnerability, one of the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, if you will, um, are women with disabilities in conflict, post-conflict, disaster, post-disaster context. And the humanitarian sector is working toward responding to the needs of persons with disabilities, I think, but there's much work to be done. Um, and so I hope we can have a conversation today about where we are and where we'd like things to go. And so, Rose, I wonder if I could start by asking you, I know you do a lot of work on the ground in Uganda with women and girls with disabilities, and particularly refugees. And so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what is life like for, for a refugee woman with a disability in Uganda? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, life of uh, refugee women with disabilities is something which is very horrible. As National Union of Women with Disabilities, we have been mobilizing the women, and uh, this mobilization is really to get the issues that affect the women with disabilities in the refugee settlements and camps. Uh, one thing that we got to understand is that the women are facing sexual violence, gender-based violence, and then they are also not accessing almost all the services that they are giving them. Why are they not accessing this one? It's because they do not have information. As you know, most of them uh, came into the refugees. Some of them have issues of mobility. So they are confined in one place. Some of them do not know how to communicate, maybe because of the language barrier. And then also the low self-esteem. And then the other thing is that um, they feel a lot of fear and intimidation because when they are trying to interface with the humanitarian actors who are doing service provision, they seem not to be listening to them. So for us as Nuwodo, we have been getting these issues, but also after getting the issues, we sensitize them. We sensitize them that you know you have a right and when we are sensitizing them, you, we use the international uh, national legal framework. For example, the UNCRPD, the SEDO, and then the Maputo Protocol. These are tools that we use to make them get confidence that they should not be doing them a favor, but it's their right to get all that they're supposed to be getting. And then the other thing that we have also been doing is to engage with the humanitarian actors, but we start with the government of Uganda, especially the office of the prime minister who is in charge of the refugees in Uganda. So we engage with them, we engage with the humanitarian actors who are doing service provision and the UNHCR so that they get to understand the issues that we have identified from the women and then also we make them understand that, you know, these women have talked and these are their issues. How do we go about with it? So that is how we have been doing. But of course, they will always tell you they do not have the resources to take care of all the issues that they have mentioned. Yeah, and, and you mentioned sort of the, the feeling that their needs aren't being met, their voices aren't being heard. And I, I know that there was a study out even that some of the humanitarian responders maybe felt like um, the community wasn't big enough to sort of tailor, ne tailor to their needs. Um, and that even some humanitarian responders don't feel comfortable, don't, don't sort of know how to approach the situation. And Mina, I was wondering if you could talk about, from the ICRC perspective, how do you um, sort of train your humanitarian force on the ground to, to be comfortable? Sure. Um, so it, it's true that um, people with disabilities have really been overlooked uh, in the humanitarian sector at large, like in, in general, um, and, and left out of the humanitarian response, which puts them in a... Um, particularly than vulnerable situation. I would argue that disability or gender is not inherently a vulnerability, um, but the fact that uh, we as humanitarian actors 
are um, not adapting our programming to, to meet the needs uh, puts, puts them in a really vulnerable situation. Um, so the work that Rose's organization and other similar organizations are doing to um, bring these issues to the attention of humanitarian organizations such as the Red Cross is super important. So that's the first step yeah. to really um, make uh, our humanitarian professionals aware of the situation. I would argue that uh, the humanitarian actors, uh, whether it's uh, ICRC, I also uh, work uh, to support the, the National Red Cross Red Crescent uh, societies in the countries as well as uh, um, the IFRC, their federation in, in situations of uh, uh, natural disasters. It's most of the time what I see is that it's unintentional because of the, the lack of awareness. Yeah. Uh, the fact that um, people with disabilities are often invisible in the communities even before the disaster emergency hits. Um, Rose mentioned uh, a lot of these uh, barriers in terms of mobility, access to information, and that stigma, those negative attitudes, the low self-esteem, especially among women with disabilities, uh, often means that then uh, they're kept at home. Uh, and that means that, uh, you know, in practice, like our humanitarian professionals, the Red Cross volunteers, Red Crescent volunteers, um, don't see them, may not be aware that uh, they're there. Uh, it's also a huge, uh, there's a huge lack of data about persons with disabilities and their barriers. This all contributes to us just not having, not responding uh, to their needs. So the, the awareness raising that um, Rose's organizations and, and similar organizations are doing is important first step. On our end, we, we are developing training. There are many national societies actually do uh, have uh, training already uh, about what is disability, how you identify people with disabilities. It's not just the visible disabilities, not just the wheelchair users and the people using crutches, um, but also their sensory disabilities, their mental health, intellectual disabilities. Um, also understanding disability is not being about the impairments, but about the interaction with the barriers in the environment that is disabling and preventing people with disabilities from accessing those humanitarian services. So, um, you know, this is a disclaimer, we're, we're not doing great, but we are uh, making strides in the right direction. We have uh, several commitments to being inclusive to people with disabilities and uh, are developing, for example, the, the training on, um, to understand the issues. But I would argue that even that, so it's the awareness, the training, but then it's also uh, about providing the tools to what to do in practice. Like, what are the actions that we need to take? Yeah. How do we adapt programming? And that's where we need further support from organizations like Roses, that advocacy is super important. We also need uh, uh, to engage with people with disabilities on the ground. We need them to tell us yeah. that like, this is the barrier and uh, then help uh, think our uh, volunteers and humanitarian professionals to think through like, well, how do we move this barrier so that it best supports the inclusion of people with disabilities, and Absolutely. especially women with disabilities. How often do those conversations happen, Rose, on the ground, uh, where you know maybe it's a humanitarian professional or you know whoever may come into the community to try to better understand the needs of, of these women? How often is there real, solid discourse around that? Uh, first of all, we need to understand we are operating in an environment that we depend so much on the development partners. And, and, and that makes it a bit challenging. Uh, for example, we have, just as Mina has been said, saying it, we have uh, a number of commitments that the, the state parties have done. And of course, with the call for action, there is an um, interagency committee that developed a tool on inclusion. And there's one specifically for gender-based violence. Mm. So we had a, a pilot project on this, and we are trying to test it. Uh, it was a, a three months uh, project, and we were able to work within the three months. And recently, we are now trying to monitor the feedback and get to see how are they progressing. Mm -hmm. So for us, as Nuodo is really uh, basically the, 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 the funding. But it's something that we are already having as a project, 
and we would feel that close engagement with them can then realize results. But also another thing is that we are engaging uh, with uh, few resettlements. For example, we are in three resettlements, two in Western Uganda and then one in, in, in Northern Uganda. But also we had one in the urban so that we are able to engage with the refugees who are living in the urban because they have their other issues. Mm. So, looking at the number of refugee settlements, there are so many and we are not reaching them. So as we are engaging with this, we are not engaging with everybody, with all the players. But it's good to have constant engagement. But even as we are engaging them, how do they appreciate the tools, for example, what Nina is talking about, developing those training manuals. Yeah. If we develop the training manuals, how will they be able to appreciate and start using them? Because what is very important is the use of those tools, like the gender-based violence uh, tools we are using. We are encouraging them to have a desk that they should be able to understand and appreciate. Because the women with disabilities have those different disability needs. So each of them, when they come, they need to understand, appreciate, and take time to listen to them. And once that is done, then maybe it can be replicated to the other settlements. Absolutely. Yeah, but we try as much as possible. In a month, to be very specific, in a month, we should be able to go there once or twice. Okay. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> If there is guidance available and there are tools and, and we, sort of, we sort of know how to move forward, what, what's, what's holding us back then? Like what, what, are, what do you think are the biggest barriers? I know we talked about um, data and maybe some collaboration. Um, and in fact, this makes me think of the, um, the inclusion charter, isn't it? Um, yeah. Data, inclusion, collabor er, collaboration, funding, capacity, what am I missing? I guess of, of all of these sort of items on the charter, where are we furthest behind and where are we making the most progress? And I'd love to hear from both of you on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, what makes it very challenging? First of all is the data. Okay. You know, during the registration from the time when the refugees are entering into our country, the data that they collect, they, they collect are not data that are comprehensive. We need a disaggregated data. That talks about the gender, that talks about the different disability categories, that talks about the age. So once we are able to get this data, comprehensive data, it helps the humanitarian actors to plan according to the different varying needs. So that we are not able to say we do not, first of all, know the needs. Two, you will not be able to say we do not have resources because that is the, the, the entry point for all of them to get to know who is in there. What needs do they have? How do we make them get this? And as they are doing all this, they should also be able to make the information reach everybody across board. Because humanitarian actors, if you need to reach the deaf person, how will the deaf person get the information that you are making? So as they are getting the human resource, they should be able to get sign language interpreters that are going to be running across. If you are informing people that you know we are having a service here, you come. A blind woman, a blind girl will not be able to know the direction where these services are. Is it okay for you to see how best we can support the caretakers? So all these are conversations around data. Hmm. Maybe Nina can add something. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that one of the challenges uh, is that the humanitarian sort of sector or movement or organizations and then the disability uh, movement and organizations work kind of in silos and, and they're not strongly linked. Certainly there uh, are processes ongoing that um, are bringing those linkages. I think the work that Rose's organization is doing is, is really unique in that 
the, it's an organization representing women with disabilities actually working on humanitarian issues. But it's fairly rare, and so we need more of those uh, linkages so to, to make that collaboration a bit more natural. Um, I think that there are these tools, actually there are quite a few tools also in accessibility and they're the new guidelines that, tool that Rose, uh, Ro sorry, Rose mentioned that are coming out. I think that the humanitarian sector is just not aware and may not know how to use them. Uh, and they, they may not know where, like, what are the organizations of persons with disabilities, how to reach out to them. The example Rose uh, gave about uh, providing sign language interpretation. But I hear from uh, our um, Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, professionals is that, or delegates, is that they don't know uh, the, the system in the countries. They don't know who to contact uh, to... Um, to get the sign language interpreter. So there's still uh, maybe that lack of uh, connection with the disability movement in that context. Uh, data is certainly a really important part of that. So what contributes to this too is that there's a huge lack of data in general in many of the countries where we work on disability. And if there is, it often underestimates the number of persons with disabilities. So when there is an emergency, whether it's conflict or a natural disaster, those first, uh, you know, one, two, three days, it's it's very chaotic, and and that's when the planning needs to happen. And it's uh, when the data doesn't exist already, uh, we don't have something to go on in that that very first phase and it's uh, quite difficult in that phase to then collect the data so you know we are looking at um, now developing the the uh, sex age and disability disaggregated data uh, looking at um, how we and what data we can use in different phases of the humanitarian sort of emergency cycle so uh, looking for that secondary data understanding the quality of it um, where we can, ensuring the disaggregation of data in needs assessments, in household surveys, uh, as well as then uh, targeted uh, data collection around disability. But we're just not <laughs> there yet. I think the yeah. humanita whole humanitarian sector is, is working on this. There's an increasing awareness that this needs to happen. Um, it's not straightforward, uh, so we still have a really long way to go. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think you know again, uh, our you know Red Cross Red Crescent uh, delegates, um, just uh, even when they have their awareness, uh, they still need that sort of practical guidance on on how to do it. Where do you find the sign language interpreter? And yeah. uh, just yeah, to so. add a bit on, please. Uh, I, I think also another thing that we need to look at is the the attitude of the the staff, the workers that um, just as she said that sometimes when the refugees are coming, the number overwhelms them. And then now when they see this is a woman with disability, they will feel like now this seems to be double tragedy. So how do we make the, the staff or the humanitarian workers be disability knowledgeable? And, and, and the issue of getting them to know about disability takes along with um, the, some of these uh, legal frameworks. Maybe they needed to have uh, a summarized um, framework that each of them, when they come, they get to know that you, know, you are going to work with these refugees, but among the refugees, we have also these vulnerable ones. And one thing that we noted Excuse me. One thing that we noted is that the refugees uh, staff, the, 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 the humanitarian staff, what they know about the vulnerable people, which of course now there's another concept which they call people with special needs. Now, people with special needs are mothers, expectant mothers, and then the minors who are unaccompanied. Now, women or persons with disabilities are not in that age bracket. So that makes the humanitarian actors, the staff, not to understand when we are talking about persons with disabilities because the people with special needs are basically the pregnant mothers and accompanied minors. So that feels like a, something that needs to be addressed immediately, right? I mean, if, if you're, what you're saying is true, that, that these communities that are often 
invisible, these people who are often invisible before disaster strikes, before there's conflict, are even more invisible afterward. I mean, but, but both of you sound sort of optimistic in terms of that we're seeing progress, it's just really slow. Um, are, is there something that's happened maybe even in the last year, whether it's guidance, collaboration, a new policy, that has sort of had you feeling like, okay, we're, we're, on, we're on the right road here? I don't think there is uh, any much in terms of policy. Okay. Because even in Uganda, some of the policies are, that are there, the biggest problem is really enforcing the implementation. Uh, for example, if we are to follow the commitments, Uganda was there and made a commitment. But what is making them not to enforce some of these guidelines? I know the, the guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities, which call was made in 2016 in Turkey, uh, has been already developed. They validated it in April in Madrid. We are yet now to see, after the validation, how are we going to make the state parties accountable in terms of using that guideline. So for now, I can say, yes, the policies are there. The legal frameworks are there. That can guide everybody. But why are we, I'm saying we, meaning the people who are implementing in the humanitarian action, why are we not enforcing this legal framework? UNCRPD is very clear. If it is about women, Article 6 talk, talks about it. If it is uh, Article 11, it's talking about humanitarian action and emergencies. CEDO is talking about uh, respect, non-discrimination. Non Why are they not implementing? And some of these are international staff. So how do we make international staff impact onto the local staff to say, guys, if you are doing this, this is what you are supposed to do. But all in all, by engaging them and them accepting to engage with us, I think it's still some progress. Yeah. yeah, I think it's still some progress, but we still need to continue engaging, but also putting a lot of pressure. And I also think the development partners who sometimes give grants to the government needs to understand how did we move on the issue of gender equality. Is it okay for us to put disability marker, like the way we have put gender equality marker, so that when the resources are being given to the development partners, we put that you should be able to design and make interventions that are disability, in, in, with disability sensitive inclusion projects? Yeah, I think that, um that globally there is momentum and I think that what uh, Rose is reflecting on is at the national level and the implementation and I think there's the gap there. So globally there's definitely momentum, there's increased interest, you know the World Humanitarian Summit was really like a kickoff but there have been uh, other, there was a Global Disability Summit last year where also humanitarian issues were uh, on the table. Uh, in the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement we have a, a global uh, like framework for this, but um, it's true that it hasn't yet translated into the implementation. We need to make sure that that happens. Um, I think that in terms of ensuring that that intersectionality is addressed, there is also a, a trend now going towards looking at accountability to affected people, community engagement, um, a protection mainstreaming approach. And this is also what we're um, using within the Red Cross movement, where we're trying to look at um, sort of the linkages between inclusion and whether it's gender or uh, disability or other aspects of diversity, how we can uh, do that jointly. But, but that's another area where, you know, it's still evolving and uh, we're still quite far from making sure that people with disabilities can actually access the services that they need and that we're recognizing that they're uh, actually a large um, uh, proportion of the population in those settings are persons with disabilities. Absolutely. I wonder as we <clears throat> sort of have a couple more minutes if I could ask you each to tell me one thing that you think needs to happen in order to bridge this, this gap, this divide that there is between the needs of 
people with disabilities and the humanitarian sector who is equipped to, to help but just doesn't always know how? What is, what is one thing maybe that you would want to see happen even in the next year um, that, that would be a signal that, that things are, are on the right track? Yeah, for me, I think the issue of taking care of the needs is very pertinent. Once the needs, the issues that concerns the needs are put on the table, yeah. then the, the humanitarian actors will have to get a, to understand that. Why are we purchasing some of these things? Right. For example, look at a, a woman living with albinism. People with albinism, for them to function very well, Africa has a lot of sunshine. For them, their needs is a, a cap that can keep them on the, sh the shade. They need glasses, dark glasses, to help them protect their, their sight. But also they need sunscreen lotion. So you, you see, those are three needs for one disability category. Now, if they are able to purchase this, the humanitarian actor staff will have to ask, why are these there? Yeah. Then it will make them understand, oh, these people need to be catered for with this in order for them to access the other services. Without this, they may not be able to get out to come and access these other services if you are distributing food and the other things. Because for them, you are coming to line, they are coming to line up for these things. And they may not be able to handle the heat. So for me, taking care of the needs and making them aware that these needs, we have taken care of them, you can still come and receive them. That is a way of making them feel we are included into the services. You know, when, some, when a woman says, a woman with disability says, we are being treated as if we are not human, that is a strong statement from a woman with disability, very strong. So for you to be human, what does it take? It takes you to look at me in totality. So for me, what I am saying is that the humanitarian actors need to take a total uh, approach in handling women and girls with disabilities. For example, if you Thank are you talking so about... Thank you so much, Rose. I'll interrupt you really quick just to give Mina yeah. a chance to say okay. one Please. more comment Mina. as we have to finish up. Well, I agree with everything Rose is yeah. saying. I would add to that that from, from one of the key things to make uh, people with disabilities, especially girls and women with disabilities, visible, uh, going from being invisible to visible is the data part. And I okay. do uh, see that there is uh, globally uh, momentum in this and I think that in the next year, a year from now, we'll be in a much better position and I think that, that having that data uh, uh, will help us with the, the planning, like actually seeing that this Addressing is a large group. The other yeah. It's not enough, yeah. but it's one step that I think that yeah. uh, we can, we'll see a difference in a year. Thank you so much, Mina and Rose, for joining me here today. And that's it for us for now from Women Deliver. Thank you.